Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers is a TV show, a cartoon that's that's on the uh, interwebs, I guess, man. But comics are cooler. We're going to be looking at that. But first, we have some comics ourselves, man, that we're slaying in. The Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive, Trey Paperback Collection. Jimmy, is this like the last... Uh, Street Angel that that's in print right now. Like everything else has been sold out at your this level. This is the most current. There are hard covers. The 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 books that are collected in Street Angel Deadly Score Alive are still in print. They're like the big oversized hardcover. I think of those almost like artist editions. I really love those. Yeah. And those are still in print. But uh, yeah, the the uh, this is this is the Street Angel that's available now. Yeah, man. So get that stuff while it's hot. Uh, Red Room Anti Social Network has hit the stands very recently, but it is going quick. Amazon bought more than half of our print run. We're car- cartoonists, we have Patreons, we have all sorts of uh, comics in our bibliography, and you and I both have link trees in the description below this video where the Kayfabe audience can go to check out our other wares. Uh, but let's take a look at the issue one, Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, man. They've been uh, teasing films and cartoons for three, three and a half to four decades and it's finally come out. I've not seen it because I like comics better. But it's at it's at uh, Peter Davidson, Woody Harrelson, I think is Fat uh, Fat Freddy, and uh, John Goodman is a, is one of the guys as that well. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a good cast of guys, man. But uh, I thought let's let's better better uh, better now than ever, man. To uh, crack open fabulous furry freak brothers and- issue number one. And obviously, Gilbert Shelton, your cartoonist here, yeah, um, one of the staples of Underground Guys, starts in Texas, I think, at, at the uh, kind of that legendary Austin uh, student newspaper doing these things. Um, but a staple through the Underground Comics and because publisher of, of uh, Rip Ripoff Off Press, Press. Yep. For, uh, for decades. So a really interesting cartoonist. And when I started looking you know, outside of Marvel DC and I found some Underground stuff, this was the guy who stood out to me. He's Great an drawer. amazing cartoonist. Great really drawer, impressive. Man. The other place where people might know him is Wonder Warthog, another one of his underground characters. He's one of the Zap crew <laughs> too, man. So you know, some of these strips might might appear in in uh, you know Zap comics, and these are dudes who got brought into the game. I, you know, I think about their generation. They're like, if if not for the undergrounds, you're a last generation of cartoonists because growing, you know, being born mid forties. The comics that you're looking at on the shelves, like, I seen what Marvel and DC was doing. You have to go running to Carl Burks. You have to go running to to Walt Kelly and, the you know, the best of whatever kind of comic strips are still out there because there's nothing happening in comics. Plus, these are the kids that were growing up during those Senate subcommittee hearings when the, the feds are saying, don't read comics, they're bad for you. How do you not get attracted to the medium when all the adults around you are saying that it's bad for you? Of course you're going to run to comics when you go to them and you're seeing that weird name war, Submariner with that yield sign shaped head. I don't know, man. you got to be a diligent wannabe creator to stick with it or you got to find some other cool stuff. Now, we did that Von Day Cheech Wizard video uh, a, w- a week or two ago uh, as of this recording and I started thinking about these cartoonists uh, in the same kind of pantheon, with the same mindset that I look at regular uh, comic strip creators, and I can filter those same perspectives through my lens while looking at these strips, because there are very few multi-page pieces. This is actually the opening strip here, like a 10-pager, uh, proper kind of comic book story, certainly something that would have existed at the time where, where they're, you know, in the 60s, they were still in that format of like 10 pagers or eight pagers. There's never like a full, you know, story in, in, in a comic book. Um, but most of the strips in here, one pagers, tabloids. So they're shrinking down giant pages of comics to fit into a, you know, comic sized format. You got to get squinty. You know what's so interesting is like you look at this page and imagine one of those tabloids if you were to reformat it, like cut the panels up so they could be this size and that would give you your tabloid amount of material at a size that wouldn't kill my old eyes. Right. But I mean, those tabloids, obviously, like uh, East Village, other, um, you know, there, there were those tabloids everywhere. Any, yes. any decent sized city. It wasn't just like the big cities that had those. And that's where a lot of these cartoonists would appear. Yeah. And I mean, they really 
were able to live, you know, like this, these strips, even in the sixties before, before the collections, which, which this is a collection, you know, this is just a proper little comic book, but it is a collection. They, they would appear worldwide, you know, now I do think that this piece was done specifically for the collection, certainly meant to fit comic book format. And you're seeing just like proper, you know, six panel, six panels a page, uh, whenever they get high and you know this is like preceding cheech and chong pot culture pot humor totally you know we Seth talk Rogen. about uh indie comics being sold in head shops like this was probably again if you're buying uh if you're buying comics at a head shop i'm sure you bought a freak brothers comic supreme lettering i mean this guy is just a fantastic cartoonist he's, he's incredible his level of skills just immaculate as a cartoonist you know like all the character designs like look how different his main three characters are it is like it is cartooning 101 perfect man you got your 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 curly headed guy who's a fat dude you got your brunette then you got your like what is that man leonard skinner looking. <laughs> yeah you, you, you got to remind everybody that you're from texas i was gonna say exactly Gilbert Shelton, exactly <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh you know you would think that it's like one note like just these you know dudes getting high and and uh you know, whatever is involved with that. But he really stretches the subject matter in a lot of ways. And it becomes a great kind of ta time capsule for this era. Uh, you know, the, there's such a bifurcation, like with with uh, Vietnam uh, sort of underway and the, the, you know, the kids versus the adults kind of uh, energy that he's able to mine for a lot of uh, material. It's an interesting approach to characters, too, where you would see Crumb coming up with these characters and then kind of like pushing against it. Um, almost like Saturday Night Live, sometimes you'll see p comedians talk about how they don't want to do that character that just has its 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 line every time it appears, you know, they throw out the line. Freak Brothers, I, I don't know if Shelton embraces it or not, but as a publisher, I think your concerns may be a little different. And having like a go-to set of characters that you can sell uh, each issue... Um, maybe it makes a lot of sense if you're the guy that's also checking the books in the back of the publishing house. Dude, publishing house, motherfuck, man. Like, I was reading interviews with him where he's talking about the offset print machine was in the crib. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was in his house. It, didn't they have a fire that lost it? Is that ripoff press? You know, I don't know that. I don't know that. I'm, I'm but not yes, sure. they did. They ran these things. You know, if you were a publisher, it didn't necessarily mean like an organized business. It might be, I got hold of a press. Let's Jim, make some comments. Uh, Jimmy, when you're Gilbert Shelton and you're like, you know, these, these hippie characters, man, and you got a, your suburban neighbors see you, hear this machine running. They see you lugging in reams of paper, like rolls of paper getting stuff like that delivered, I mean, the feds have to be watching you. Like, like, is it, what are they running through there? Communist, <laughs> subversive underground newspapers? Like, like. Also, like, what's that smell? Yeah. <laughs> he would talk about like when they would run the press, like, you, like it would have to be at a time where you're just not sleeping. You're not sleeping when the press is running. Oh, they're massive machines, like cast iron parts and stuff. That is not a quiet operation. <laughs> I, I worked at a print shop that had its own uh, offset press, and it was like a separate part of the building where the press is because, I mean, it's that's an industrial piece of equipment. Dude, this is a good strip right here, man. Uh, Fat Fat Freddy gets hold of a slot car racer. Oh, yeah. And Phineas is the, uh, he's the brains of the operation. He's like, oh, dude, I can make a real, real life version of that. And, and they rig up a proper car yes, and run it by way of remote control. But then you start to see the little influences, mm -hmm. right? You see the Carl Barks, you know, Beagle Boys showing up, Duckburg Times. So these are the comics that these dudes were pulling from. And uh, these early pieces, a couple of pages, man. This is like a three, four, four pager. I wonder where these things showed up. Like they're, they're kind of um, bookkeeping in terms of like where these things appeared. Non-existent. And it's kind of unfortunate because I'm curious, you know, like it's it's worth knowing that stuff to just have some sense of the landscape. Where where can guys who are making comics like this have a freaking outlet? Because it ain't going to be uh, taken over for, uh, you know, the Harvey Kurtzman one pagers in Marvel Comics or something. It's not Powerhouse Pepper. Yeah, and I assume they didn't need to, you know, at the height of the undergrounds. I think there were a handful of underground artists that were able to make that work financially. Yeah. 
Um, it's interesting to look at a comic like this that just feels so rigorous and think of it in that, like, in, in, in the context of, like, pot culture. Yeah. You know? Was uh, Shelton straight, like a straight shooter? Was he straight edge? You know, these are these are really impressive. Um, the detail and, and the focus. Like, again, you mentioned lettering. Look at how tight that lettering is. That's the other thing, too. Like, when I first got my hands on this, I thought these guys were just so unhinged. They wouldn't even, like, be able to figure out their way around Ames lettering guides and stuff. But these are, like, well-constructed pages. He's got the T-square. This this lettering is ruled out. Yeah. And uh, I remember there was this... Uh, uh, it's the, professional level cartoon. It's professional level cartoon that would stack up against any other cartoon, like cartoonist that would be in your regular newspaper. Exactly. It's a subject matter that pushes them into this mm -hmm. space. Uh, but it's still like replace Garfield's lasagna with weed, and uh, and, and and there you go. But uh, the the level of craft it, it does. I was thinking the other direction in terms of like not maybe not straight edge but like what is the draw like was oh, right. was adderall i was gonna say speed right is what is <laughs> yeah like like some sort of thing where it's like you get supreme focus you know yeah. it, it ain't coke I, I i i see exactly what you're saying there Ed. <laughs> this this is um see they're cutting up he's cutting up stuff and and creating these pages because this was like a four pager that was that was in an underground comic you know, it had a different masthead and stuff. So he's he's rearranging things. I love that, like, they come from, like, you know, broadsheet, growing up reading the funnies. So there would be yes, those tangential Yes, I was just going to say that. Fat Freddy's Cat, who's gotten several comics himself over the years, but running that as, like, your footer. Uh, love it. It's it's so neat. It's such It's a real comic in every way. Uh, you know, when you think of alternative comics that we grew up with, 80s, 90s stuff, it, it was very different than a lot of the other comics. Whereas this is still in that model of like same, all the same principles. And all the stuff of that time period is covered in here, man. How many freaking hijackings were there back then? Like it was just, the airplane was a bus that would like just be traveling in the <laughs> sky and anybody could get on. Right. And they're parroting like, all right, we're going to to Cuba. And then another guy pulls out a bigger gun and is like, we're going to Tangiers. Uh, and then it's it's like Cuba. If we go to Cuba, marijuana is illegal. We're getting put in, in jail. If we go to Tangiers, weed is so plentiful that it's only going to cost you a buck <laughs> to like get some stuff. So that's going to ruin our business. Uh, another guy calls up, says we're going to Jordan. And it's like, Fuck, we're we're just all going to be political hostages if we end up in Jordan. So then our guy takes off all of his clothes, holds up his little hippie bag, and is like, "I got a bomb in here. We're going to wherever the fuck we said we were going from the start, or else I'm just blowing us the hell up." And then and then uh, at the end, they get uh, saluted as heroes <laughs> for getting the plane to its uh, proper destination. It's so dumb too. Like he gets naked for no reason. Just no, to make a really funny panel. Well, no, you got to be the mad bomber. You got to be so crazy, yeah, 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 so right. unhinged. This is Gigi Allen. I'm gonna fucking shit on your face. It makes for a very a funny comic. I'm a crazy guy. So, so that's this page, and then this page is like, you know, the narcos coming to your house, trying to raid your place, man. And and dude, they were blowing up a they were blowing up an inflatable uh kind of couch thing like a beanbag but their breath has so much thc content <laughs> that when this narc busts their thing looking for drugs all of that all of that thc breath is getting into his nose and he's seeing like whatever like pharmaceutical or like you know whatever kind of like shit they got hold of back then it must have been more pure or something because like i don't know anybody talking about seeing heavenly gates and shit from just from just marijuana that's real funny it's a, it's a MacGuffin, but it's also the way comic strips are built. Right? Exactly. Like there's one concept, and it's like, we are going to look at this thing from every possible angle that we can come up with. And he does a fantastic job with it. <laughs> this is great. Love seeing like the comic strip characters show up. There's, there's, there's a lot to it, too. Dude, like This strip in particular, because like these guys are railing against the establishment. Uh, but to like these like little kids, like they're the squares. Yes. You know, and he's getting a, a chance to play with like, you know, all the hitters. Yeah, it's great. Except Poking fun of it at himself. Except for this one. I'm sure people out there know who what, what strip that is, but yeah, I, I don't. recognize that. I, I can't remember exactly who it is, but I do. Re that, that is a character I recognize. Pimpin' Subvert uh, comics, the, the Spain Rodriguez joints. 
all these guys were connected with each other. Well, there, you know, there's only a couple of presses, right? You know, uh, I'm sure they all knew each other, and they're all running out of, like, the same city and stuff. A couple of cities. You know, you had the Chicago crew. That's Jay Lynch and Skip Williamson. Uh, ripoff and, like... Last Gas. Yeah, yeah. So you had and, the uh, Texas Boys. The uh, what are, the San Francisco Comics Publisher. What, what, what's the other... That's uh, Gary Arlington. Arlington. Yeah. So yeah, like a lot of a lot of guys end up in that San Francisco area. Like I'm sure they were all familiar with each other. How couldn't you be? You know, like it, right as soon as you found people that made comics in your town, it's like, all right, I got to go see who this person is, what they do. Absolutely, man. The amount of work here, I think, for several years, the Freak Brothers comic is just collecting strips it's not even original material yet it takes a while to get to idiots abroad i love this logo treatment that's the other thing man fantastic letterer uh th he'll eventually settle into using the same kind of typeface like the same the same panel kind of like proper mm -hmm. comic strips would do but for a while like he had maybe like three four or five different ones and, he, and then he would do fresh ones uh for a bunch of strips and all different looking. This one is real great. Like we saw, there was like a Dick Tracy one earlier. Uh, this is the Harold Gray. Down to the lettering treatment, you know, with the with the balloons and stuff. Part of the fun of doing those kinds of homages. And this is that classic, like, th this shit still works today, man. The Like, I call them the Appalachian hipsters. And it would be like... People, they grow up in whatever kind of weird s circumstances they, they came up in. They come to the big city, and they are not streetwise. So they are getting run true <laughs> right. to ringer, as, yes. as my uncle would say, man. <laughs> get run true to ringer. Uh, you come here, you get knocked up, you get hooked on something, but you make that phone call, and you could call mom and dad. They could come rescue you. You could go be a debutante again. And then the last panel, she's railing against her capitalist parents for, uh, you of know, course. being wasteful, all that kind of shit. Yeah, one of the things when I started reading these underground comics, I was surprised about is how much of them is uh, kind of the same conversations today. Totally. You know, there's a lot of ecological stuff in here. Um, it, it really surprised me just because it felt like, I just heard this on the news. <laughs> you know, I'm reading a 40-year-old comic, and it's the same story. Yeah, it proceeds like, uh, you know, 1990s slacker generation, modern-day Zoomer, laissez-faire, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to work after COVID kind of energy. Like, uh, it's the same stuff all the time. But then you have your timely pieces again, man. So like sharks and jets kind of shit. They're they're going through Central Park trying to score something, and then all the various gangs. Like this is before the Warriors. Yes. You know, like all the neighborhood block gangs are coming out. Dudes called the Pig Fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> the rip the rip off Park Werewolves versus the rip off Park Pig Fuckers. <laughs> and then we get into some like you know West Side Story type. It's I always shit. so desperate them trying to squ like like they've got to get pot. They have to find it. Th that's that's the argument for um for Gilbert Shelton being straight. Like cuz it's like yo you got these guys nicking for this shit like it's hair on. <laughs> you know that would make sense if you were doing a strip like this that you would blur those lines because it would give you story material. You sure. know like like you could and, and plus like who are you selling it to? Like you're sure there's a bunch of straight people. It's like anything else that uh what the subject is may actually be going to the opposite. Sure. And so, uh, yeah, whatever the worst fears of, of this drug culture are, pour them all into this strip. The opening strip is great, man. It's uh, it's a propaganda film. So they're doing the drugs, and then they're like, yeah, let's go rape some people. <laughs> right. uh, hey, man, like uh, maybe we could go beat up a crippled old lady. They pull out knives and they kill each other, and they're watching it on the projector. Like, yeah, we got we got paid two thousand bucks for this, and it's that it's that thing where it's like you know these councils and stuff like that, like the feds, like you know giving some. This was up always babies. fun. Also, look how stoned Fat Freddy looks there. It's like a Muppet. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that feel like uh, Jamie Hewlett? That's exactly who I would have named. Man, that's even yeah, totally. Even like a character from Fireball looks just like him. Yeah. You know, like, we're, we're glossing over and we're looking at page after page of this stuff, but I promise you, pick up an issue, sit with it. Each of these strips is very rich. The second I cracked this open, like, I finished reading it. Like, like I was very thrilled to, to read this thing. And I was, 
you know, thinking about cracking open issue number two, it, it reads, it, it's, it looks so dense because we're, we're um, shrinking down these giant pages of comics into like the standard comic book format. And it could look overwhelming and daunting, but he's such a good cartoonist that the flow is so professional and effortless and you, you get, you get caught up. You love the characters. Absolutely. And it's been printed and reprinted enough that, you know, people worry about the kayfabe effect on some of these books that are hard to track down. You can find Freak Brothers comics. Yeah. And it was getting reprinted so often. Like, like this cover says 295 and it says it's from 1980. I think it started in about like super early seventies. The, like these, these things with like a 30 cent sticker and a 40 cent sticker. Uh, this has been reprinted dozens of times yeah like here's a version that i have of it it's a it's a giant uh you know collection and it's 2008 so you know these things um one of the nice things with with creator ownership you get to keep them in print you get to control that and uh gilbert shelton has done a really good job of that making these available yeah jimmy o- th- over generations i think over time like we're gonna have to look at that idiots abroad uh yes. strip man the one that made the list of the tcj's uh, most important <laughs> comics of the 20th it's such century funny drawings like so often his drawings are just funny you yeah know? like think how many comics they just don't do funny anymore he's a he is a good solid cartoonist you know these guys were, were dismissed because of subject matter and uh just you know it's such a weird period of time like they're all just a bunch of fuck-ups but there's a reason he gets to live in france all bougie like next to uh R- richard belzer's chateau yeah very, got very his... uh, celebrated in fact you know what man we didn't we had him under the hot lights man mark miller uh he said something on on uh facebook or something that like he was he was in Paris, man, riding shotgun with Gilbert Shelton when like a lot of crazy stuff happened. We might, we might have to get him under the lights yeah, again to tell that story. Tell us that story. <laughs> <laughs> in between promoting Netflix, let's hear about your adventures with Gilbert Shelton in Paris. For sure, man. <laughs> That's the stuff. Uh, dude, I actually have them in my next comic as a uh, do. as an Easter egg. Yes, you do. So uh, something something for kayfabers to keep in mind whenever. I finally have another comic out. Look for them in the background somewhere. Yeah, it's real good too, man, because I'm sure anybody mm-hmm. in the administrative process will like, oh, that's a nice drawing. <laughs> None the wiser, man. It's an Easter egg. That's goddamn right. Uh, Jimmy, let's get back to business, dude. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. What do you have out there, Jim? Join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rug where you can download a dozen of my out of print zines and mini comics. You can see my lots of my original art, layouts, uh, scripts, the process that I make comics like Street Angel, Plain Janes, and Octobriana, and more at patreon.com slash Jim Rug. Red Room, the anti social network, trade paperback, a good. Uh, Book collection is in stores right now. It's going fast. Uh, If you see it, don't take for granted that it's going to be there for long uh, because they are flying off the shelves. Red Room uh, Trigger Warnings issue number one. It's going to be hitting the stands in December. So make sure you get your hands on that thing because that is surely going to go quick. Uh, You can get to all my links in my link tree in the description below this video. I'm serializing the uh, trigger warning stuff before it hits paper. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. All right, man. Give them those marching orders. We'll be on our way. Read more comics.